feel that we are peculiarly and remarkably privileged to celebrate this Thanksgiving. I really sincerely believe that it is the most important Thanksgiving since the landing of the Pilgrim Fathers, maybe much more than that. I think we should all give thanks that the laws governing the universe, taking care of us all, are still in full operation. This is very, very important. We have long been suffering from certain delusions, but in the last few years these delusions have worn thin, and more folks every day are coming back to the realization of principles. For a long time, the whole world was subject to the narcotics and the mysterious tensions of wealth and fame. We have gradually created a situation in which we have become money addicts. We no longer assemble money or save it. We are ruined and dominated by it. It is like cocaine or heroin. It becomes in itself the only source of a high. And in our civilization, a high is wealth. And as long as we continue to think that way, we're going to come in the end exactly as the uh, narcotic addict comes to a tragic conclusion. We, however, are now seeing a gradual unfoldment of the consciousness of the people. We are gradually seeing values restored, not because most of the executive brackets want these values, but because the average individual is recognizing them as indispensable to his own salvation. The people are beginning to be heard from, and they are being heard in the right direction. Especially in this country, it is not to be heard in terms of violence, but in terms of basic change of policies, basic corrections of faults, basis redirection of habits. And that is very wonderful because it is starting, going now. And for the first time, certainly in the 65 years that I've been working, I can see the most important of all things, that people do not come just to listen and say yes. More and more individuals are becoming involved, involved in the improvement of society, the enrichment of their own lives, and they demand for a higher general governing body. This is all to the good. Uh, in India, they have the law, of course, of karma. And in the West, we interpret that law largely in terms of penalty. We speak about bad karma, but seldom about good karma. Possibly because we're not earning as much of that. <laughs> but we also are not fully correct in our interpretation. The real meaning of karma is consequence. It is the result of things. All things have consequences. All causes lead to effects. All causes are not evil and all effects are not tragic. A good cause results in a good effect. Right causes cause right consequences. And we are beginning to realize that we cannot sow weeds and reap a good harvest. We are on a planet now with six billion people moving through an unknown dimension of space like a little ship in a vast ocean we do not know anything about these other planets other than perhaps their distances or something of their chemical compositions. We have no idea of the life that is upon them, if any. We do not know the morals or purposes of these other worlds. But we do know that the little world that we are on is a ship in itself that is going forward to an unknown destination but it's gradually getting back on course. We are beginning to realize that progress is not in terms of the further advancement of technical knowledge 
progress is the improvement of human character. And without this improvement, there is no essential progress. And without this improvement, every discovery, every adventure of mankind leads to further tragedy. So we are now thinking this way. In the last 25 or 50 years, there have been major changes in the religious and philosophical, scientific and economic perspectives of human beings. We hear, for example, that not long, a few weeks ago, uh, the Russian government permitted the people over here to send Bibles in Russian for their people, and in large quantity. This is a very interesting thing. We know, for instance, also that the Chinese people are now returning to Confucius and are allowing missionaries to return from various Christian denominations. Everywhere, religion is creeping back. Why? Because these countries cannot exist without it. Without religion, there is no way of directing the human being which is acceptable to his own soul. He can be deceived, he can be variously outraged. But when he is told right, and when he believes in truth, and when he experiences the reality of divine things, he is moved in the proper direction. We also know that in with each of the countries of the world there has been a major change in education. Educational facilities are improving, and there has been a great movement coming all around that education, while it should not be theologized, must be given the advantage of proper ethical foundation. Ethics must be taught to children. Morality and ethics have nothing basically to do with theology. They have to do with survival. Survival in a complicated civilization in which dishonesty is destroying itself. We also find grave dislike for entertainment. More and more people wanting something better. Better literature, better art, better music. These things are coming back after a long period of doldrums. And so we say that as we approach this Thanksgiving, it is with great hope and with a realization that we are watching the unfoldment of a general, peaceful, benevolent revolution leading to revelation of value. We are beginning to see the dawn of a better day. And we know that it will come as it has always come, out of a certain bitterness, out of a sorrow, out of tragedy, out of loss. Always the individual has turned to reality only when all else has failed. As long as he can be selfish and succeed, he will be selfish, catering to the poorer and worser part of himself. When he can no longer uh, achieve his nefarious ends and must be honest or perish, he will choose honesty. For a long time also, in the 20th century, we regarded ourselves as in the vanguard of progress. We were the great people of the world. Every day we had a new invention. Every day we had a new science. We have had one step forward after another upon the economic and industrial level. We created the uh, aeroplane, the automobile. Then came motion pictures. Then came radio and television. And now nuclear physics and many other things coming very rapidly. Each one of these was baptized as a blessing. Each one has become in proper realization of facts a curse. We are unable to use what we invent. We abuse it before it is patented. We cannot use anything as it would be normally used for the general good of all. We must put a fence around it and claim it as private property. We are doing everything we can still to maintain this. But one by one, we, we face fa facts and values and problems that cannot be ignored. At the present time, we have more wars than we had a hundred years ago or five hundred years ago. We have constant corruption in every level of society. And this corruption is gradually forcing upon us the realization that profit through corruption is disaster. 
But as long as the prophet continues and the disaster is abstract, things go the same. But after any conditions such as existed in Bhopal and the nuclear establishments there, as it, we see it now in various countries with their dictators and their policies, when we see everywhere the complete failure of dishonesty, we can no longer condone it. We can no longer cheer for that which is obviously wrong. And we are beginning for the first time perhaps in a thousand years to clearly distinguish between right and wrong. Not right in the book, but right in life. Not because we don't read the Bible, but because we don't live it. We are beginning to realize that consequence is inevitable, and that consequence is not a parent recklessly punishing a, an ignorant child. Consequence is the individual's own conduct leading to its inevitable results. As long as the cause of chaos exists, chaos will exist. As long as the cause of corruption exists, corruption will exist. We cannot correct these things with words. We cannot correct them with legislation. We can correct them only with conduct. And on this Thanksgiving year and day, it might be a very happy and wonderful thing if more and more of our people and the peoples of all nations should realize that correction begins with us. Correction begins with the individual gradually rising above the various selfish instincts which, and appetites which he has learned to accept. He has learned to live badly and recklessly, and it is only now that the facts are coming home with irresistible force. We are gradually exhausting the power to be corrupt. We are gradually exhausting the means of continued profit-taking. We are beginning to come to the end of this so-called golden age of selfishness. So before us lies perhaps a very important circumstance. With all this aggression, with all this confusion, with all this profits, with all the experiences up and down on the New York, New York Stock Exchange, with all the things that have happened with this system on which we are able to build private fortunes at the expense of public good, we are still not happy. We're not getting anywhere. Every so often we have to limp our way further into international debt or create laws to restrict some abuse of other peoples but not ourselves. So we now come face to face with the very simple fact that honesty does pay, that honesty is necessary to the election of public officials. And this brings us also into a view with our religious problems. Religion is in trouble. And uh, a number of ministers, as we all know, have been in trouble in their TV programs. The, uh, the answer to the matter is very obvious. We have always believed that the highest virtue was to preach religion. What we are going to have to learn gradually is that the much more important thing is to live it. And this is where the, there has not been adequate emphasis. We should not re continue to believe that we spread the gospel by converting the heathen. We can, we can actually spread the gospel when we get over our own uh, misdeeds. So every individual who belongs to any religion is going to gradually come face to face with what that religion will do for him in the emergencies of his present world. Well, it will enable him to live well in a society that can be redeemed by right living. Is it possible for him to contribute to that ever-increasing group of people who are determined to correct some of the outstanding faults of this century? We have to have a religion that doesn't merely instruct, it must inspire. It must not only tell us the story of the gods and saints and sages, but it must give their personal contribution through right living, through self-dedication de de to the living of the life. This is the only answer to the religious dilemma and this is also the basic answer to the social dilemma. 
It is the entry of a truly mystical, idealistic way of life into our economy that can redeem it. It is only when the individual thinks first of the sorrows of others and, less for, and not even second for his own gain. We should be more concerned over the tragedies of Afghanistan and Abyssinia. We should realize that they are parts of a great program that has been supported by a huge economic concept that the most important thing is to sell somebody something, no matter whether he can use it or not. That we must keep up the props, profits. But we are now coming to the point where the losses are coming in like a tidal wave. These things now are not going to hurt only any really sincere people. Not really. It may reduce a little luxury spending. We may not have quite so many opportunities to waste money. But the most important thing is that the individual who's right is not going to be left to sink. The uh, just person, the intelligent person, knows that these corrections are long overdue, and he is willing to make certain sacrifices of his own if it will contribute to the salvation of human society. The individual, the average individual, is not as selfish as he has been taught to be. There is within each human being a, a, lenter, a center of idealism. There is an integrity there which has been gradually smothered out by, by a completely materialistic way of life. Among those factors that have been responsible, as we might mention, uh, materialistic science. Materialistic science is constantly talking of its contributions to the advancement of society. But materialistic science is the cause of most of the great disasters which have come to us in the last hundred years. It is science that has led the way to discovery after discovery that has sustained pop, uh, mostly armament and high competition and uh, has developed great labor problems. All kinds of things due to the fact that labor-saving devices are of very little practical value unless they permit the individual also to earn a living. All these things are coming back, the public schools. We are worried about the, pre the present morality of the 15-year-olders. We know that a considerable portion of our youth is on narcotics of some kind. We know that the moral standard of, of modern people is much lower than it should be. Parents sit back and wring their hands and do not know what to do about it but the children are largely out of control because they've been taught to be out of control by their associates and by the traditions of the generation in which they live. We are resenting discipline because it interferes with the right to do wrong. This is not any longer possible. And gradually there is coming back also the most important dimension of this entire situation and that is a mystical, idealistic renewal of our faith. We are getting a new renewal. Some of it is rather foolish, some of it is strange, some of it will pass away. But the fact of the matter is there is a renewal. The individual is beginning to see beyond the horizon of his material existence. He is beginning to realize more and more that there is no future for materialism. It has run its course. It has been destroyed and is being absorbed into a new concept of existence simply because it is no longer workable. We cannot have a materialism in a world in which there is not, not enough essential materials where the problems of living are real and intense. We cannot solve these by more labor-saving devices. We cannot solve them by legislation, by the election of committees, and all this type of thing. We live on a very small planet, and uh, we do not realize the tremendous restrictions under which we function. The planet is just the right size for people if people right, are right. The planet will take care of 10 billion if they live according to the law of cause and effect. It can take care of innumerable waves of life if its own inner life is honorable, dedicated, and unselfish, if it knows how to save rather than to spend, if it knows how to be kind rather than unkind, 
If it gets over its own superstitions, its jealousies, and all these functions which are permitted to go uncorrected, we will no longer pass them on to the next generation and have another generation like our own. I think we are really having a magnificent thanksgiving. We should give thanks to the fact that the light is beginning to dawn. We can look around and see how person after person, group after group, is coming along determined to do something about it, to change values. And every one of these groups is a ba basically idealistic. Now, there, of course, are problems coming along with it. The, the individual's idea of success has got to be also taken into, into spiritual consideration. To us today, there's only one success, and that is wealth. Maybe a little secondary success called fame. <laughs> but that's about all. You, the, the proof of the fact that you're right has been that you have more money in the bank. Gradually, this is almost irrefutable evidence that you are not right. Something is wrong. And in religion, we are still problemed with the fact that religious groups have become highly involved in the economic situation and having difficulty in extricating themselves. But at the same time, the truth does remain that the uh, final purpose of religion is to help people to live. Religion is to share and to give. And religion is most of all the realization that each human being is part of a responsibility for the survival of the humanity to which he belongs. This type of thing will be of great assistance to us in days to come. There is a, a Chinese point of view that has been coming up now, both on, in mainland China and in Taiwan. And that is that there are different kinds of people, each one with his own way of looking at life. There is the poet to whom life is a verse. There is the sage to whom life is wisdom. There is a mother to whose life and who to whom life is to bestow life. There are all kinds of people, each one with a different philosophy, ethics, morality, spirituality, but all dedicated to some value. The time has come, as Confucius and Lhotse pointed out, when these different values have got to get together. It is no longer possible for the individual to feel that his own particular specialty is of greater importance to the world than anyone else's. That the artist has a responsibility to humanity is evident. That the playwright has a responsibility to humanity cannot be denied. That the scientist has a responsibility for the advancement of the total human group, which he pays very little attention to now, is concerned primarily with the percentage he's going to get from the story. And the same in the professions. The purpose of the lawyer is to create and establish justice, not to personal wealth, but to the good of the society to which he belongs. The purpose of the doctor is to help the sick, not only to get over their ailments, but to prevent them. And his work is a work of labor for the common good. Until the common good comes above and beyond private profit, he is not the great physician that he should be. And unfortunately, the great physician and private property are hard to, to work together. Because there is something about everything that we like that which we think is likable. Now we've got to work for that which we know is workable, the solution to the problem. So everywhere there are people groping for something better, at the same time sinking in a morass of economic involvements. There is always a fleeting danger that the individual will lose what he has. Now this is something that the scriptures of old took care of rather carefully, so we can think about it. Here is the individual who is 60 years old, and he has established himself with a comfortable fortune. Now comes the problem of how can he add to it, how can he multiply it, and what can he do with it? And it doesn't make any difference who he is, 
I think it's all been summed up in the words of Andrew Carnegie when he said very simply, it is the right of the rich man to live rich and die poor. He should dispose of it all for the common good before he goes. And uh, Carnegie did this by establishing libraries, not only in this country but abroad. Everyone who has a great wealth knows that he cannot take it with him. He cannot take high office with him. He cannot take the plaudits of his enemies and friends with him. He comes to the time, every human being comes to it, that what he is becomes more important than what he has. This decision can come earlier, and the individual can have a much richer and happier life if he finds this out early. But whether it's early or late, it's forced upon him. The law of cause and consequence steps in. He cannot take out of this world that which belongs to this world only. But he can take himself out of this world if he escapes from the worldliness with which he is now afflicted. So we have a great and privileged opportunity to start to think things through correctly. At this moment, there are a number of nations, all of them large and small, most of them searching desperately for what might be termed autonomy. There are countries that are not any larger than Los Angeles County that want to be totally independent. And the moment that independent comes, up comes a little dictator and takes over. They, it's a part of a process not of bringing the people into a truly free condition, but removing a large distant overlord for a small immediate one. And the problems go on, the revolutions go on, dictator after dictator comes in, is deposed and sometimes assassinated. The thing goes on forever, and it simply cannot do this much longer. And it's wonderful to realize that this fact is gradually coming into focus. And every day a new disaster comes along that brings it into more, more direct focus. In the last month or two we've had some very powerful evidence of our troubles. And we realize that every effort will be made to leave things as they are, to preserve the status quo. But to preserve the status quo today means to fall backwards, because we've got to outgrow the static into which we have fallen. We've got to move out of the complacency, which has nothing to testify to it any longer. While there was opportunity to spread the economy into primitive areas where there was always a new continent to conquer, it was different. But now we are all together on this one little ship sailing into the unknown. And the only hope we have, the only reality that we have is internal conviction, is the realization, as Plotinus puts it, that there is within each body that which is not body, that there is within each of us a mind that is not a worldly mind. Within each of us is part of an eternal life that is indestructible. So we've got to begin to fall back on the indestructible eternal life and outgrow these things that pass away even before we have a chance to do anything with them. So we have now a new Thanksgiving motto to give a lot of thought to, that this year we're going to really have something really worth being thankful for. And the things that we want to be thankful for are world peace, economic security, proper education, a workable, practical, applicable religion, relief from all these false usages, the dedication of usage is something that's very, very important. We may have new discoveries every minute. Now, these new discoveries are not necessarily wrong. Some of them I may, may be very right and very good, but a new, a new invention or a new concept of life, which is going to affect large numbers of people, must also be dedicated the day we invite or invent the machine, we should dedicate it to the common good and not to private profit. When we make a scientific discovery, we should dedicate it to the sick 
and not to the price of the operation. All of these things, every bit of knowledge we gain, every new device we create, every new thought that comes to us can be of value to all of us if it is a dedicated contribution to social progress. If it is something that we're going to store up in ourselves or sell stock in, no longer will it be of any essential value. The time has come now when the individual, eight, eight billion of us, have got to work together and stop working each other, as has been the general policy. Now, the quietude of it all is that everywhere we see this happening. Materialism, from the standpoint of popular support, is essentially dead. Scientific materialism is not even mentioned anymore. The scientist hardly dares to admit he is, science, is a scientist after what has happened to nuclear physics. Every one of these discoveries can be a great benefit to mankind if used and can contribute to the collapse of the planet if abused. So the difference between use and abuse must be part of education. We must be taught about it. We must be told about it. And we must reward those who do it right. We have also, in time, to discover a new way of rewarding accomplishment. To us, the only way is to make wealth. If we can get, get to bestow a wealth, then we reward. What is certain is that that is not the answer. No matter how much wealth we get, ultimately we'll be taxed out of it. What we really need is a new system by which the individual who does right receives certain recognition, certain cooperation, and becomes a properly recognized citizen, and not the simply one small voice in the background. Gradually, the change of, of values will, re will produce this improvement. It will produce it on educational levels. The whole university system is in need of being refocused, redeveloped. Everything needs work. And no, no one wants to take a chance because it will cost him his job. This particular pattern is now also breaking down badly. The political systems of the world are falling apart. The powers that, with ulterior motive that were able to control and misdirect public energy, they are falling fast. They are revealing their own ineptitudes and their own inadequacies. Gradually, we are going to lose faith in corruption. Now, that's a big thought. Just imagine it. We're going to lose faith in being dishonest. It isn't as attractive as it used to be. There's not so much danger about being caught. That isn't the real problem. The real problem is we have to live with the results. We have to live in a world impoverished by war, plagues, earthquakes, and the sordid disasters. And we find that the law of cause and effect, or cause and consequence, is not only a general prevailing law, but it operates in each of the brackets and sections of society. There is an effect or a consequence for any concept that we develop, any policy that we follow, any attitude that we maintain. Everything belongs to law. If we are given to rock music and we get too far enough with it, we will find that it will destroy us just as quickly as cocaine. If we cannot do anything that is contrary to harmony, rhythm, order, and the proper rectitude of living without paying a penalty for doing so. We can see what happens, and we remember what happened in Europe after the Crusades. They came back from Europe after fighting for years in the sands of, the, of Palestine. The war was inconclusive, the Muslims finally won, and the best part of Europe was buried out there. And but not long afterwards, there came a plague out of the East, and one out of every three human beings died of the Great Plague. One out of every three living Persians. That was a great lesson for somebody. 
It was the plague was the result of the tyranny, the corruption, the actual inhumanity of man to man. A whole world drowned in hate was next drowned by a little insect, a flea, that carried with it the germ of the bubonic plague. So we go on down through from the Crusades to the Spanish Inquisition. We see the rise of various denominations. We see their virtues and their vices. We see gradually all the changes that take place. But in every single instance, there is a consequence inevitable and exact in terms of the problem. Uh, the problem with the outstanding example of cost today is the falling and cor corruption of the U.S. and world stock exchanges. This is the direct result of breaking the natural laws of economy. The natural idea that we can live on the interest of money itself without work. And as a result of that, we are letting money work for us. And it has declared bankruptcy for us. And we are still worrying about it. Our moral issues are in the same condition. In the midst of all of our other troubles arises AIDS. A problem in, in, of, of ethics and integrity that answers uh, hundreds of years of human dissipation and immorality. You can't get away from the consequences. And you must stop causing them if you don't want them. On the other hand, there are good things that have been done. It is not all bad. There have been some wonderful things. But according to our present system, a good and wonderful de deed is an accusation. We don't want to publicize it. We don't want people to know that there are good people because this might make them a little dissatisfied with their own mistakes. We want to keep the good news silent. We want to keep unselfishness from becoming generally popular. And so we do not bring it into much of our entertainment, our literature, or onto our radio and television stations. Occasionally something comes in that is good and is usually a mock success. All the way along now, we've got to begin building uh, for a simpler and more reasonable way of life. This is not a, an answer in the form of a great revolution. We don't expect to, not, to give another crusade. We've done that. And it didn't work because it wasn't the, done with the right motive. It couldn't work where an individual wished to spread the peace of God by weapons of death. This is not the way it's done. But in our present problems, we have a lot of people that are just good-natured, kind-hearted people hoping for something better and working industriously with each other, digging into old ideas that were wonderful and forgotten but were just, are just as good now as they were 25 centuries ago. We are becoming more and more interested in comparative religion, in idealistic philosophy, in Pythagorean and Platonic ethics. We are interested in Platonic and Neoplatonic mysticism and the wisdom of the early church fathers. We are beginning to see out of the darkness a mystical world, a world of internal values, a world of strange intangible beauty which we have closed away from ourselves by our own behavior. This world within us in which peace rules supreme is a kind of lost Eden which we must find again. But there's no reason why this planet cannot become once more the garden it was before we got hold of it and subdivided the property. <laughs> we can have a beautiful world on this little ball running around in space. We can have kindly people. We can have values that are not commercialized. There is no reason why the individual cannot be part of a commonwealth in which all working together produce equal goods for all. And this was the, really the basic concept behind Moore's Utopia, one of the great idealistic books of the 16th century. There has always been a dream of this ideal world. There's always been the belief in every part of the world 
that we have not been left alone, that behind us are a hierarchy of mysterious divine principles, that there are teachers that have been sent at various times to us with revelations of the law. There have been good people who have done great work. There have been unselfish people who gave great example. And we have in our history and record of our race a magnificent and glorious chronicle of human achievement, dedication, and idealism. These things have been forgotten, but all of a sudden they are remembered again. When Thomas Taylor in the early years of the 18th century, or 19th century, pardon me, was working on his translation of the theology of Plato, he was only able to print a handful of copies. He was poor, and one or two people helped him to get a few copies of this magnificent work of Proclus on the theology of Plato. No one was interested in Plato's theology. No one cared anything about Neoplatonism. Uh, to a mate, many, Buddhism was a heathenism. No one really went, meant anything. But within the last five years, the works of Proclus are being reprinted, and they are very massive. All the great Tom's translations of Thomas Taylor from the Neoplatonist and Platonic philosophies are coming back into print at very, very substantial prices. The belief in better literature is coming back. The great works of the past are being reprinted but almost as rapidly as new things that come out because we are beginning finally to realize the value of experience. Lord Bacon pointed out that experience and tradition are part of the basic value which we have to use in the discrimination of a philosophy of life. We have to learn what is available. We have to think what others have thought and find out somewhere among these things a new idea or a new interpretation suitable to our own needs. It is useless to say that we shouldn't have reference to the past. We all use it. We use it every day. To, to wipe it out would be to give an amnesia that would result in practically a complete, of all, a complete collapse of all civilization. We need the past. We need to use it now. We need to contribute to it. We need to make our present the past for future generations in which our true accomplishments will add to the permanent growth of society. We're coming very closely now to the next century. And the next century, according to Nostradamus, was to be a century of improvement. It was to be a time in which the paraclete, or the Prince of Peace, would be able to come back to life in the world. Uh, we are working primarily, therefore, for peace. Now, peace is something that is uh, also a temporary ending, at least, of military aggressions. But this is not the peace we are talking about. We are talking about the peace of God. We are talking about the deep internal sense of security <laughs> that comes to the person who has right love, right hope, right faith, and right knowledge. We know that there is a peace that comes when we accept the reality of a divine presence. There is a peace that comes when we know that cause and consequence are related in absolute justice, that we do not expect and must not expect favoritism. We cannot expect to bribe the infinite. We cannot expect to outgrow the laws of existence. We are completely under them and will always be under them. Therefore, our problem is to cooperate with the realities, help them to f become generally available, and help our own lives to use these realities with greater and more immediate practical value. All this type of thing is part of a Thanksgiving celebration. We give thanks that we are alive to see the wheel of the law turn. We are very grateful that we are going to be allowed to observe the reintegration of world integrity, that we will escape another Atlantis. And instead of going down dis dissolved by the waters of the ocean and, by, and also not go down by nuclear physics, we are going to find that we can save a world without losing it first. <coughs> 
that we do not have to begin again in caves or on desert islands. We have the right at this time to use the consolidated energy and effort and integrity that we have to make these corrections while they can still be regarded as preventive medicine. We don't have to wait until the very worst happens. Probably the worst that happens is always when the problem hits us as persons. When we become involved in a difficulty, that difficulty takes great shape. But when other people are difficult, are in difficulty, and we only watch them, our own smugness does not subside. Today we all have to feel it or it will never be done. So we have a, a great deal to work with. If we look at the map and look at the political situation, we can say simply and honestly that with all the progress, with all the science, with all the understanding we claim to possess, and with all this progress we hear about and seldom see, we're in the worst shape we've been in 2,000 years. And we are not coming up. All these discoveries don't solve it because we will try and have tried everything except self-improvement. That is the one thing that we don't want to do. We do not want our luxuries to be curtailed. We don't want to have anyone dictate to what we do with our dollars. We should not need to have such dictation. The individual with the dollars should also inherit with it the value of what it means and what it signifies. He should realize the meaning of the words on the dollar and the bill. In God we trust. And it took years to get that out of our banknotes, but it was finally done in this treacherous and terrible situation. If it hadn't been for wars, panics, and, and uh, epidemics, it probably would never have passed. But it's now on all the paper money also. This is a proof that emergencies do produce results. Now all we know is that if we can move that statement off the paper dollar and into our own personal lives, uh, we'll make another great step forward. Now, when we are told that in God we trust, but we are also told that it is our duty as human beings uh, to sustain our part of the universal re responsibility. We can trust God if we keep the law, keep the rule, and we'll follow the consequences. Uh, and the word consequence I like so much better than, than the ones normally used because it means a direct relationship to a previous circumstance. Consequence means that cause and effect are closely related and inseparable in value. Uh, this fact alone could do a tremendous amount. If our young people could accept the idea of cause and effect, we would have many, many return, re, re, uh, store their integrities and refrain from narcotics and other uh, mistaken procedures. In the, we need to know definitely that the law works. We don't trust the police system. We can't take care of it anyway, even if we did. We haven't enough jails to take care of all the uh, criminals. But it would be a wonderful thing if we didn't need jails at all and these cells could be turned into one-room suites for people who need a roof over their heads. No gods, but a garden. Well, this is a uh, type of thing that has to be given thought to. Now we will say there will always be people who are incorrigible. There are always people who will not do what is right. But these people also are a consequence. They have been caused by something. The average person who is wrong is a product of a system which is basically wrong. The individual who has not the courage to stand for principles and truths has already been betrayed by circumstances over which he had no control or for which he was not strong enough to cope. All the problems that we have today, and most of the problems of crime, uh, have as their proper natural cause the nature of the civilization in which we now live. Improve the general life of people and you will reduce crime. Improve the general life of the individual and we will reduce crime. 
Give children proper training, proper religious insights. Give them the realities of McGuffey's Reader and get them off of some of the uh, books that are now sold under the counter. And we will find that young people improve. We know that uh, young people are now organizing in many places in an effort to combat problems that are peculiar to their age groups. They want to get out of it. They want to get well. And they should become part of a vast program. It's not a case of nations trying to understand each other's and preserve the corruption. Each nation determined to do as it pleases, but all others should change. This is not any good any more than it is for the individual. The problem is that we are going to be squeezed, and this squeezing will keep right on. And there will be more exposés, and there will be more epidemics, and there will be more earthquakes, and there will be more unemployment, until the individual realizes that there is a cause for all these things and that this cause is correctable but it is only correctable if integrity takes the place of ambition and personal wealth if we can uh, if realize that at all times civilization is in our own hands we are the ones that made it we are the ones that are ruining it and we are the ones who must rebuild it when our first fathers came over here, uh, we found the Indians were here. And uh, the Indians uh, were invited to some of the early banquets uh, for the celebration of Thanksgiving. And everybody felt pretty good about it. But when it came here, uh, the, uh, the Pilgrim's Mayflower, first voyage, was also bringing with it most of the bigotries of Europe. It was bringing with it the same poisons that had made Europe unlivable. This whole Western Hemisphere came into power, came into prominence, and became the garden spot of Earth by the circumstances of Europe. Over there, things became impossible. Vice was rampant. Petty nobles were killing off their people in futile warfare the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, the Ten Years' War. No hope. Nothing for the average citizen to look forward to but slavery. No religious tolerance. You either belong to one or two groups in each country or you were in trouble. The uh, neighbor determined your religious belief. If you didn't agree with the rest of the community, you were ostracized. There was no freedom of faith no freedom of worship, no recognition of values beyond or behind the jots and tittles of the sacred writings. And when they came over here, what did they do? They brought it all with them. They hardly got settled before they threw out Roger Williams for nonconformity. And he went down and started the smallest state we have, Rhode Island. But these uh, people who came over here brought their bigotries with them, their intolerances, they were escaping from a, a foreign yoke and then imposing another one upon themselves. And the history of the early settlements in this country are miniatures of the situations in the old country. Uh, they are small groups, each striving to maintain its own isolated purpose, each one in competition to all others, each one determined to convert or condemn anything that didn't agree with them. And finally, they got together and, and turned their attention to de destroying the dignity of the American Indian nations. So we, didn't, we brought it with us, and we're going to keep on having it, because this type of sickness is like the uh, mysterious problems of the bubonic plague. During the plague, plague, a great many people to escape the plague got on ships and went out to sea to be away from the plague. Most of them brought, took the plague on the ship with them and they all died together and the ships were derelicts floating on the sea for a century. Everything was about the same. Now we are in danger also of this mysterious germ that has affected us. This germ of economic uh, inevitables. Everything must make money. Everything must be profitable. Everyone must support what he likes but what is necessary he has nothing for. 
also he is determined in any way possible to perpetuate this system. He does not even think of improving it because he doesn't know how he should improve it. His schooling never taught him. His university never taught him. He was always taught to conform. He was taught to follow the leader. And if the leader was going nowhere, he went nowhere with him. These days are gone. Each individual has a right to be a person. This does not give us the right to break laws, but it's as Abraham Lincoln said, he would not break a law, but he hoped to live to make a better law. This is what we're up against. We don't want to break laws, but we want to make better laws. We want to create a gradual reformation of circumstances until the individual and the dignity of human purpose is preserved. We are also fighting against the destruction of our natural resources. We don't know how long we're going to roll around in space in this little ball, but we know how much timber we have, we know how much petroleum we have, and we know how much space we have for the, the refuse of human existence. We know definitely that under the present policy, our days are numbered from the mere standpoint of physical survival. And there's no way of making it any easier. The individual will not do the things that would make it better. Instead of conserving in every possible way, we are wasting in every possible way. And are encouraged to waste because waste contributes to profit. All these things, in now, in the last five years, have come into focus. And I suspect that practically every nation in the world has within it now dedicated groups that do not want violence, do not want to overturn governments, but want to enrich and ennoble their own conduct and character and to have their little part to play in the achievement of world peace, world harmony, and world abundance. These things are possible, but not while selfishness is at the helm and self-interest is dominant in practically every private citizen. So we have these things to think about, and I'd like to try to point out the value of a certain effort that we can make. Each of us, I think, believes in these principles. We believe in cause and effect. We believe very definitely in reincarnation. We believe very definitely that there, there is a reason for our existence, and that we are going somewhere. And we know that no matter what we do, we cannot be annihilated. That is, that the eternity in ourselves is indestructible. But it can be perverted. It can be restrained. It can be damaged. It can be hurt by the conduct of the mind and the emotions and bodily habits. Therefore, we know that we are, according to every conviction, beings being prepared for a greater destiny than now. We are evolving even though we are passed out of the ordinary steps of evolution. We are no longer moving from one kingdom to another, but we are moving from one conviction to another. We are moving from one level of consciousness to another. We are growing in spite of anything that we do. But there seems to be no reason why we must continue to grow more and more painfully. There seems to be no reason why it's necessary for nature to bestow another war on us or something of this kind in order to bring home the truth of life. Nature won't bestow the war, the war under any condition, but our own ungenerated and unregenerated attitudes may make it come about. We don't want to, we can't afford it, we don't need it. So each person can start in with just a few little quiet things. First of all, he can get over fear. He can get over this innate terror of losing his job or of some great disaster hanging over. Uh, he doesn't have to worry about that as far as his own life is concerned if he is living as he should. His own concern is, can he be a maximum of value in time of emergency? If his help is needed, is he ready and is he prepared? This is the thing that should concern him. Not fear of the future, but will he be strong enough to serve the future when it comes? 
will he be able to do the things that the future may deem necessary. Therefore, he has to start in little ways to do the things that he honestly, internally realizes to be correct. He must stop making the mistakes that he has made for ages and at least make some new ones instead of keeping the old ones going forever. So I'd like to think of Thanksgiving not just as sitting down to a dinner, but as rather sitting up to a fact of one kind or another. That look around you and see what's happening. Observe the organizations, movements, and groups that are springing up everywhere for the purpose of bringing back to us some of the ideals that we need in order to meet the future with a good hope, or at least with a great deal more uh, capacity than we have at the present time. Let us see what you, we can do with ourselves. Look back over your own life. Have you got any grudges anywhere? They won't help. But the, a grudge is a cause of consequence. As long as you have the grudge, nature is going to throw it back at you. Do you have prejudice? If you have prejudice, the cause will become, if in due time, the means of a consequence in which prejudice will do you damage. You cannot hold any attitude that is wrong without ultimately running against the consequences. Dishonesty, all these things, chicanery, unreasonable ambitions and false profits from poor workmanship, all have their consequences. It cannot be controlled by the unions, but consequence cannot be defeated. So let's start right away in the between now and the next Thanksgiving when it comes along in setting causes, the consequences of which will improve ourselves and those we know. Let us help to do better by children, give more time to those who need understanding, be a little selfish, less selfish in our expenditures, more thoughtful of those you haven't spoken to maybe for years, Get rid of little by little the isolations which result in the consequence of isolation. This world is filled with lonely people and much, much of this loneliness is consequence, the result of something of an earlier date. So we should start as soon as we can to build good consequences so that we can face tomorrow with the realization that we have invested something good in it and not as simply carrying on into it all the old rubbish that has deformed or distorted our minds and emotions for the greater part of life. And we also realize that very definitely now the importance of thought. Thoughts are things. The mental life of the individual is a very important common factor. There is a world mind, there is a race mind, there is a national mind, there is a community mind, and there is a family mind. There are all kinds of groups of intellectual uh, attitudes and convictions. We have found that we can think together for common good and help it to come sooner. That we can think together for honesty and it will improve. We can think together for peace and peace will be closer. There is something within each of us that tells us that thinking is a cause and right thinking must have consequences. And these consequences are an improvement of the life patterns in which we live. Everything that we do right brings right. Everything that we continue to contribute to the old corrupt way of doing things helps to perpetuate the sorrows and miseries that we want to dispose of forever. So use the mind with the realization that it is possible gradually to improve your own thoughts. Your mind can be more healthy than your thinking. And if you give it a chance, it will think higher thoughts than those to which you are most usually acquainted. Therefore, we can use the mind very definitely to help to build proper thoughts and proper conditions. But we want to make sure that these conditions are the right ones. And I think in all prayers, you always have to bear in mind this simple fact that even at our very best, we know only what we want, not what we need. Pythagoras pointed that out very definitely and refrained from recommending prayer 
to be a fulfillment of personal desire. I think we should realize that prayer should always be accompanied by the con conviction that this is what we want, what we need, what we believe, if it be right. If it is not right, let eternal right be done. We must always allow that we may mean well, but do not know. And with all the searching of the years of the humanity, generation after generation, looking into the mysteries of life, has become so fascinated by achievements and rewards and successes on this little molehill that they have never looked out to see what lies beyond. They have never taken into consideration what might be out there, which is the cause of us, which is the reality of us, and which in some mysterious way continues to lead us, whether we will or not. There is something there. And we may have the realization within ourselves that that something is good, that something is right. And the proof of it is that we've been doing wrong for ages and it hasn't worked. We keep on making the same old mistakes and we get into the same old troubles. So that that obviously isn't the answer. We can't uh, bluff our way into peace or contentment or prosperity. But we can unite in the dream of a better world. The best kind of a world that we know. The best kind of a world that we can understand. Where there will be neither poverty nor crime. Where there will be peace and friendliness. And a cooperation in which we shall live together for mutual good. In those days we will have opportunity to become better people. Most of our energies and resources today are devoted simply to survival or to the maintenance of some little standard we have created arbitrarily. We are working forever for something we can't take with us. We are working for dollars and forgetting the inner life with its needs. The inner life does not need expensive physical things. It needs dedication. It needs the realization of the importance of inward realization of right. All over the world we have beautiful groups of people working on these things. We have groups of people in every religion. But the religions are also in bad condition. Religions have taken it for granted for some unknown reason that their major purpose was to convert somebody. That, they were, that if they could convert someone it was perfectly right to do so. And that a non-converted person, an individual who doesn't see it their way, has no right to exist. This type of thinking is still bothering us quite a bit, in some parts of the Near East especially. But with all this type of thing, mysticism is increasing. It is increasing because it is in every religion. It is a, a level of conviction. Mysticism is a rea realization of the reality of things unseen. It is the recognition of a divine right at the source of existence. It is a recognition of the mercy of the infinite. And it is also a realization that this great plan with all of its myriads and uncountable multitudes of worlds and spaces, all of this is part of a manifestation of the eternal love of a great power, a universal principle, but forever working for the common good, working for all things to bring them to the proper destiny for which they were intended. Everything in nature demands our obedience and gives us so generously if we obey. Everything that we try to do today and in the near future should be with the thought in mind that there is a world that needs work that there are things to be done that we must do if we are to compensate for our own mistakes, for the things we have done badly. We are not asked to do penance. There is no such concept involved. There is no use in suffering because we have caused suffering. The thing for us to do is to cause the end of suffering, to come about with the peace and truth that is necessary. Penance is of very little value because the individual may punish himself but the world continues the same. What we want is consequence in which the individual recognizing his mistake corrects it 
everything indeed uh, depends and requires a new standard of values in which we are not just repentant of what we've done but de dedicated to what needs to be done and that is what they came here for in the first place that's what this country was established for in the beginning theoretically it was to be a haven for those who were troubled it was to be a place of protection for those who were unjustly treated it was to be escape from the prisons of the old world and from the corruptions that were dominating both Europe and Asia today however these corruptions have crept in here and the very people who leave other places to come to us find growing in us the very things they left behind and hope never to see again so we have to recognize that we were an assignment of destiny we were here because there was something for us to do we were to prove the great experiment of the ages that it was possible for human beings to work together and create a commonwealth of achievement we are here as a hope of the ages we are here as what was regarded as the final proof of the wisdom of the gods well we can still be and probably will be the final proof because we won't fulfill our own destiny until we become the final proof of universal destiny we have to become evidence and example of the very things that brought pilgrims to our shores over 300 years ago we have to do these things we have to begin to build this world to be what it has been hoped that it would be the hope of the ages that it was to be the place where suffering ended where all things were fair and just and equitable and we have sort of slipped away from this thought we've gotten to find we found a prosperous country where we could make a few extra dollars and here we go well within reason we can go but as soon as this concept is perverted as soon as the country loses its uh, birthright its destiny and compromises all other things as long as it becomes a great hotbed of terrorism and difficulties as long as it becomes uh, overstocked in narcotics and all this type of thing as long as it is victimized by world corruption it cannot fulfill its duty but we cannot be um, polluted we cannot be victimized unless we permit it the individual cannot take on any of the delinquencies of humanity unless he does so unless he takes it the decision as St. Augustine says is, as, is his own and well, he has the power of choice he can choose to be right or he can choose to be wrong but he cannot actually uh, dominate or, or completely rule the consequences of his own choice the moment he makes a choice consequence steps in but if he uses the choice that he has he can choose a consequence that is good he can take a world that is now in bad condition and by using the theory of cause and consequence he can begin the building of the world of tomorrow in which causes we set in motion today will result in peace happiness and security for those who are to come some people say well maybe we shouldn't worry too much about those who are to come after all we won't benefit from them the answer is very possible we, we will be the people who, <laughs> who will come we may return and we may find the bed we have made waiting for us <laughs> and we'd like to be, have it a nice comfortable one and if we depart leaving behind us a world which we have done nothing to help we will return to a world that has not received any help and this we do not want all things have got to be done fair and square and uh, the pilgrim fathers as far as they went were fair and square but they were also square toed and very puritanical that doesn't help much but it is the, the opposite of it complete lack of discrimination or control is no good either the control comes from the heart 
and is rationalized by the mind and is distributed by the hand. These working together give us a better world and are the things we look forward to with great hope. Now, for dinner on Thanksgiving, I suppose most of you will have some indigestibles. This is going to and you so be prepared for the consequences <laughs> of uh, minor overindulgence. But at that time also have a little dedication somewhere in connected with it. That it is through the grace of providence that we are here. That we are here to celebrate anything. It is only our own good deeds that are keeping us going. And we must not forget to use them. And also that we should make a kind of dedication in ourselves that when we meet again next year the world will be another step towards peace. That in one way or another things will happen and we will take grasp every opportunity to make a better world and by so doing build a better destiny for ourselves and our children. These things have to happen and I think it's wonderful to look and see them happening. This, and when we see it, it looks a little sad for a moment. I'll grant that. It looks sad to see what happened to the stock exchange. It looks very sad to see what happens to AIDS. It is not at all encouraging to see what happens to the treaties that we try to establish. These things are causes of quiet disappointment and to a certain degree of suffering. But one thing they tell us very strongly and positively, that that which is not right will not work. And that is the most hopeful thing that the only reason we have these problems is because we've earned them we have earned chaos and we will have it but by the same law we can earn better wages and have them also so if what we do wrong continues to produce trouble what we do right might be worth experimenting with at least moderately to see if we can't find some answers that will help to get us into a permanently better condition we must gradually get over the idea of the inevitability of the status quo. Things do not have to be forever the way they are now. They do not have to get worse all the time until everything falls apart. When human beings begin to think, they'll get along much better than they do now. I remember my old friend Dr. Bronson always used to say, when people's stomachs are as empty as their heads, we will have revolutionary improvement. <laughs> we'll get further when people become personally affected. Nothing will make a, a better change in the educational system than the fact that our own children are not getting along so well. Nothing is going to do better to reform medicine than that, that we can no longer afford the exploitation of it. We cannot expect anything to happen to law unless we stop being overcharged for every legal purpose or stop causing legal difficulties. All these things are correctable, but we have to do it. No, no legislation can actually work while we cannot count on the integrity of the legislators. So in all these matters, we have much to be grateful for. We know for certain that we can build a better world. We know for certain that we can perpetuate our civilization until it can go on into the next stage of life which is important to the eternal growth of things. We will have enough resources if we don't abuse them. Ways will be shown if we, through our ingenuity to live, to live as better people. And we will gain new insights in science we'll be doing something besides in developing atomic warfare. All of these things can be turned to great improvements gradually and inevitably if ulterior motive is removed and each individual does the thing as the best he can and is dedicated to the fact that he will contribute nothing to the common miseries of his associates. And with that, uh, a dedication on Thanksgiving will go very well. It will make the, the dinner taste better and make the future look better. It's a good time now to look out and see that the world is changing for the better. You don't have to think so. You don't have to believe or hope. Read the paper, watch it, what is happening in society, and you will see that the change is in process. And for that change, we are truly thankful.
Yep. 